Uh, glad to be here. Uh, this is my first time at NTU, so uh, very fun to go to a new campus. Um, this talk will broadly be divided into two parts. The first part is a little bit more polished. The second part is a little bit less polished. Uh, sort of, uh, this is a series of two papers that I wrote over uh, the last two years. Um, and one of them is CVPR 2022. So this is from two summers ago. And then the next one is not yet presented. It's going to be CVPR 2023. And so unfortunately, uh, due to the fact that the camera ready is due literally like next week, I'm still working on those slides, so they are not perfect. <laughs> However, um, it'll be fun. Let's talk about cameras. Uh, all of you have them. Some, most of you have them in your pockets. Um, in, in the modern world of camera photography, oh yeah, by the way, uh, title there, website there, go to that if you're interested. In the modern world of uh, mobile photography, or photography in general, um, actually, let me just preamble before we get into this. No one owns a DSLR anymore. No one owns film cameras. Uh, statistically, like if you uh, look at the data being generated on the internet today, if you look at what is being shared through WhatsApp, TikTok, uh, WeChat, whatever, no one is sharing DSLR photos anymore. You still have some professional photography, but in general, 95% of internet traffic is mobile, mobile phones. Um, and the reason for this is that mobile phones have gotten crazy good at taking pictures of stuff. Uh, we have gotten very good at post-processing. We've gotten very, very good at making uh, thin CMOS, thin, cheap CMOS sensors that go into these things. These things are awesome. They, they do everything. And so uh, to demonstrate how awesome uh, mobile phones are nowadays, uh, I'm going to do a brief intro to direct time of flight. There's this uh, method for estimating depth to objects called direct time of flight. So you'll see this as LIDAR. If you read uh, things like autonomous vehicle uh, literature, which is essentially using a laser and a very, very sensitive timer to send out a pulse of light, Sorry. have it hit an object, come back, measure the amount of time it takes to travel, and then uh, use that to measure distance. This technology, up until a couple of years ago, was big, bulky velodyne sensors. So these are like big spinning lasers that cost tens of thousands of dollars for, uh, for a nice one. But in recent years, uh, Apple and the association of the companies they've been working with have developed uh, single photon avalanche detectors that uh, develop sensor technology and laser technology that is small enough to fit into an actual mobile phone. And starting with, I think, the 12 Pro and 13 Pro and the 14 Pro, you now have an actual uh, solid state depth measurement system inside of a cell phone. And this is nuts. Like, this is actually crazy. We have gotten to a point where we are miniaturizing uh, not only, we have not only gone to sort of advanced silicon manufacturing where we have cool, amazing sensors that can do uh, you know, 4K imaging, or also shoving in literally space technology into our phones. And what can we do with it? We can do a lot of this sort of AR, VR application stuff. So if you play around with an iPhone, I don't know how many of you have uh, developed apps or have had brains about developing apps. But uh, in the iOS sort of sphere, there is a library called ARKit. It's uh, made for making AR applications of, I don't know, uh, a lot of them are just like, I want to play with a dog inside of my house, or I want to apply this weird TikTok filter to someone's face. Um, through these libraries, we have access to video, depth streaming, and uh, just to sort of demonstrate like how good this, uh, this library is how good we've gotten uh, in terms of uh, 3D reconstruction. This is sort of a reprojection of you take one of these frames, you push all the points to 3D, and then you're projecting it to sort of where the phone estimates it is in 3D space. And so we have high quality video, we have high quality depth, we will get to the asterisk in a bit. And we have very, very good tracking of where the phone is in physical space. If you play around with like modern AR kit, 16 or whatever the version is now, you can literally like walk around this room, you can walk around the NTU campus through the hallways, come back, and you'll have like the slab system is great. Like you'll have a seamless loop, it'll know exactly where the phone is at all times. It's awesome. Like again, um, phones are nuts. And uh, just to put this in uh, uh, the same words in different words, we have access to 60 frame per second video, a high quality RGB. 
we have access to 60 frame high quality pose estimates from this AR kit library. We have access to this uh, depth from uh, with the help of this uh, SPAD, these uh, sensors. And all of this in a tiny computational platform that fits into your plan. So at this point, like uh, uh, one of the main sort of story points I'll be making throughout this talk is that every cell phone that anyone has is a computational imaging platform. It is nuts that we have access to these things and we should be playing around with them a lot more. But, and here's the, here's the but, here's the point of paper. Uh, the grid, the laser grid that you're actually using to do this sort of depth reconstruction is incredibly sparse. It is four by eight lasers. If you multiply those two numbers together, it's not a very big number. And the actual mesh that you get, if you take just the LIDAR depth estimates at face value, it thinks that this, this pumpkin is basically just like a smooth golf ball. And why is that? One sparse grid, like we don't have a lot of measurements, so you don't have a lot of points sampled in space anyways, so you, you don't get those details. And two, it actually turns out that under the hood, uh, the iPhone is using regular monocular depth estimation. You can think like Midas or Demon, if any of you guys are familiar with sort of classical like computer vision depth estimation stuff. It's using regular RGB guided depth estimation and in fact, the way that they're using this LIDAR, that they're using this like uh, laser sensor inside the iPhone is they're literally using it to calculate alpha. They're using it to calculate the scale of the scene. It actually doesn't give them any content. It's, uh, it's just to turn uh, pixels into meters. And so what happens is that this thing has very, if you take a single image, you look at one uh, picture of this board, it has very ambiguous depth cues. And uh, also let me know by walking around, you can no longer hear me because I do that a lot. Um, this thing is kind of a nightmare when it comes to uh, classical machine learning because no data set, no hyper sim, no uh, flying things 3D, no object data set contains that gourd because I bought it from Whole Foods and I can guarantee you I have the only copy of that one. And it is now actually in my trash bin because it went bad. Um, so what do you do? Uh, machine learning is very, very good, but you will always have outlier things that are outside your data set. And we don't like this golf ball. We want something that's nice that we can use for AR, VR applications. We want something that looks like that. We want a pumpkin shaped pumpkin. And so the answer here is we look at that third number in all these columns, which is 60 frames per second. Um, Sort of the evolution of uh, these like imaging pipelines has gone to a point where like we can get high frame rate uh, data. We're kind of just still spewing it out one frame at a time. Uh, each of these frames is calculated basically independent of each other, and we're not actually using that temporal information. But the cool thing is that when you are taking pictures of stuff, oh uh, sorry, we wrote an app to take pictures of stuff. Very fun. Does not matter. It takes pictures. Uh, uh, we'll see this a couple times in this talk, which is that. Uh, there is no data collection tools for this kind of thing. So I had to write my own data collection tools, which mostly involved me bashing my head into Apple documentation for months on end. Uh, very fun. I highly recommend it. I actually have email chains between uh, me and like Apple camera engineers where I'm like, hey, this feature is undocumented. Like, how do I do this? And the engineer is like, you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> I was like, uh, like I had uh, problems like, oh yeah, like I have this buffer that I'm capturing over here and it's in this like weird format. And I don't know how I'm supposed to read it out. And the email I got back was like, you know, that's not a documented feature. Like you're not supposed to be able to do that. So I can't help you here. And I'm like, cool. <laughs> uh, so lots of fun writing these things. Uh, highly recommend. Uh, well worth your time as a PhD student. So when you are capturing picture of, uh, pictures of things, unless you have had all of your limbs replaced with cybernetics, which I don't think most of you have, um, you are not perfect tripods. This is a video, by the way. When you're taking pictures of stuff, as we have learned from burst photography, uh, you are constantly uh, adjusting basically the tension on your muscles. Your view, is, uh, your view is drifting a little bit from breathing, from heart rate, from just not being you know, a perfect tripod. And so when you take captures of stuff, um, so if you take something like an Apple Live Photo, so this is like a three second capture of stuff, your viewpoint changes a little bit. And for the most part, if you read literature in sort of burst photography, 
Uh, there are papers like structure from small ocean. There's these like really awesome papers that look into depth reconstruction from very small uh, changes in angle. But if you read sort of literature in burst photography and what people are doing with modern camera pipelines, they're actually kind of going in the opposite direction. They say that because there's movement between frames, we're going to use four frames or eight frames because we want to basically pretend that the world is static. And then the way that these like super resolution denoising, et cetera, papers often work is they kind of treat this like a 2D matching problem. You stack all your images together, you find some kind of kernels that merge your pixel content, and then bippity boppity, you get HDR photos. But the thing that I argue in this paper, and that we will find out is true, uh, is that there is actually enough stereo baseline in these things to do useful stuff. So if you take two second captures, these are 120 frames each, it starts ends at 117, so I already a lot. Um, you find that on average, your shakiness, one is not actually isotropic. You have a, you shake more in one direction than the other. Lots of fun stuff in the subsequent old paper. But in general, over two seconds, you're getting a couple of millimeters of movement. And uh, it can be as high as sort of like a centimeter, like 15 millimeters if you've had a lot of coffee. It can be as low as only a couple millimeters if you are boring and do not drink coffee. But on average, you're about getting a tenth of a uh, tenth of a millimeter between frames. You're moving in a, a path of about a centimeter over two seconds when you're taking a photo of stuff. And yeah, you have an overall effective stereo baseline of about six millimeters, so that much. And this may not seem like a lot, and that is because it isn't. Um, this is an anaglyph, so think like 3D photo put on your glasses, whatever. That little stripe is how much this frog, how much parallax effects you get from this frog when your camera moves six millimeters. So this is what we are trying to reconstruct that from. It is a horrible, awful, ill-posed problem. And um, as we have found in literature, uh, very difficult. But uh, we now have the uh, ability to process large amounts of data and to squeeze quadrillions of pixels together to get some kind of uh, to get some kind of result in that if we remember from a couple slides back that key thing that I highlighted in the box was 60 fps we have a lot of frames at our disposal and the question of like okay if I give you a stereo pair like I give you something with this kind of stereo disparity and I ask you to find depth for this this is a garbage problem like this is a ill-conditioned awful terrible no good luck Good luck finding any depth solutions or anything problem. But if you take the whole burst stack and you try to do something where you try to find a, a depth estimation such that everything is consistent. So frame one is consistent with frame 37 once you, when you project it through. Frame two is consistent with 60, is consistent with 58, was, is consistent with 117. When you take all of these, these frames together, it's not that you just have six millimeters of baseline and you're trying to do this ter terrible stereo problem. You're actually trying to solve a problem of you want one depth map that makes these 500 million pixels all consistent. And that is actually a much better problem. Like that is a much, much more well-defined problem because now you go over and over and over again and you query a bunch of stuff, you query a bunch of points in these images and you want to find one thing that makes them all consist consistent. And that is the method and the main crux of this paper, or, uh, sorry, the main uh, topic of this paper, which I will uh, basically not cover at all. I'm going to speed through this and I will explain why, which is that uh, this is the first paper in which we have an approach to do this, but it's honestly kind of a lame approach. And the second approach I have to do this is a lot more fun. So we'll talk about that one. But in, in general, uh, this flippy floppy thing that we saw in, uh, in this animation, uh, is what is going on in this main figure of the paper. I highly recommend uh, reading the paper if you have the time. It's I, I tried to make thing I tried to write things goodly, but I don't know. Uh, ho hopefully, it, hopefully it is explanatory. Essentially, in the extremely high level, like please do not worry if you understand or do not understand this. Um, what we what we do is we grab the lidar depth, this garbage, uh, blurry golf ball depth that we get from the iPhone. We grab, say, kind of like a Nerf, we make generate a bunch of rays, and then this is sort of showing the process for one ray. We grab a point in this depth, we project it into a reference image. So this would be like frame zero. We grab a color from that reference image. 
we pass uh, the color and an encoding of the position. So basically we pass like, okay, we take the bottom right corner of the depth map of this reference uh, of this uh, uh, sort of reference position in, in some RGB space. We sample a color from frame zero. Then we pass that color and an encoding of the position of the, where we're sampling into an MLP. We get a depth offset. So this is sort of like, we ask this uh, implicit uh, uh, representation to give us a correction to this depth. To, so, this is, so this is the Apple LiDAR, is bad, is blurry, is blobby. We ask our MLT, MLP to fix this stuff to give us some correct offset. Then we use that uh, offset plus these AR kit poses, plus the poses that we're getting from this Apple uh, library to then reproject this corrected point to the query frame. So this would be, so this is like frame zero, 3D projection, frame 37, frame 100 to frame whatever. And then we grab the color over here. And then we say these, th these two things should be the same thing. So essentially, this is a bundle adjustment. Uh, also, I'm saying a lot of uh, terms that, like, I'm assuming there's fami famili ah, familiarity with 3D reconstruction stuff in general. If things I'm saying do not make sense, please raise your hand, and I will try to explain them. This is sort of the standard um, uh, depth reconstruction in any sort of stereo photogrammetry, any sort of like depth from color information work is that you grab a bunch of things in some images and you say that, you know, if I'm looking at the fire extinguisher from here and I see red at this pixel location, if I move over here and I know what my change in pose is, I should see red in that same location. And by matching that color, by making it consistent, we can get a 3D reconstruction of the world. Here, we're doing the exact same thing. We just use this MLP, this beautiful implicit representation to store our, um, our depth values, and we're learning an offset to the LIDAR data instead of just learning it from scratch. We will learn why that is. And then we're taking some basic photometric loss and we're back propagating it and learning this whole thing. Also, there's a confidence map, ignore that. Uh, basically, we also give the network the option to just completely discard parts of the scene, because as we'll see, if you look at these scenes and we look at the stuff behind the board, there is no parallax information here. You're not reconstructing any depth for this. It is, uh, as we say in the academic field, it is garbage. There is no information here. And so we let the network basically discard that, those areas. And in those areas, we basically say that we trust the iPhone depth, like the LiDAR is good enough. All right, let's talk about other methods uh, that do depth. There's stuff like consistent video depth, which is a Facebook paper, there's now a second version of it where they basically look at this, these sort of flickering effects and these sort of inconsistent depth estimations between frames. And they basically take an entire video and they do this exact same reprojection step that I did in that previous slide, trying to make colors match between frames, but they do it in an over-parameterized way. So they have one depth map per frame. And it turns out that if you have one depth map per frame in burst photography, you are way over-parameterized. You can basically solve for really bad depths because you can brute force, like basically find a solution for every, like all of your burst frames are almost overlapping. So you can find multiple solutions for the exact same depth because you, you have one depth map per uh, for like for, uh, 120 copies of the same depth map and they're all bad. And we'll get back to that again of the concept of over parameterization. There's this depth supervised NERF. So this is, um, a NERF paper that also takes in uh, cold map depth points or any kind of depth points that you can feed it. And it's, uh, it's a slightly more like geometrically aligned NERF model, but it has the same problem. It's big, bumpy board, lots of depth artifacts. And the reason is, is again, you're over parameterized. So, oh no, I don't have a blackboard. I have a whiteboard. Do I have markers though? Or did I bring my own? I'm not that good of a student. Whatever, I will. Put... I saw what you could bring it down. Don't worry about it. I, I can demonstrate in the real world. The reason that NERF or any of these uh, protective geometry things work is because you have a bunch of views of an object, and I, I see my favorite 
There is no colored objects in this world. That is bubble. I see bottle from this direction. I see a blue pixel in my center black. And then I have, an, I have another camera view from here and I see blue in the middle. And I have another camera view from here and I see blue at the bottom. And you cross all these lines, you cross all these paths, and where that blue intersects, that is the model you have solved for depth. Great, you've done three reconstruction. If you put in a burst, uh, if you just put in burst photography, if you put in this uh, super overlapping, slightly jittery frog into NERF, the problem is that it, your ray is like brown, 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 brown. It, it's all the same thing. There's no, you don't get any, you can't figure out where the paths cross to get depth. The paths can cross anywhere. You're over parameterized. X, Y, Z is really hard to solve for. Um, previous work, pretty good. Can't do backgrounds. Also slightly blobby. Uh, LiDAR, pretty good. Looks like golf ball. But if you look at the normal map, there ain't no normals. It's very flat and sad. And then our amazing thing has, you got, you got the hands, you got, oh crap, the color on this is terrible. Um, imagine in your heads that you can see the color contrast here. Is there a way to turn off the lights at the front? Yeah. Well, I'm after very important. Amazing. Now we can see some more. Yeah, you got, you got some bumps over here. You got some normals. We have the hand back. It's no, no longer using this image. And if we look at sort of 3D reconstructions and we put these into Blender and we spin some lights around them, you can see that this is a pumpkin, that is a golf ball. This is a man, that is a Saturn man. Awesome. So we take the already really good Apple depth and we make it better. And that confidence map thing that I showed earlier is that. In all these regions where I don't have any information about depth, I just leave them alone. If they're good enough, we trust the Apple IR, it's great at doing plain fitting. Cool. And so we fix what we can fix and we don't fix what we can't. And then the cool thing about it is because of a term called common fate, which I will not go into. Uh, when you have very ambiguous scenes, like you have this uh, statue of Ganesha on a black and white, uh, this is the carpet in our lab. For, for single image methods, this is kind of a pain because you don't know where does this guy end and where does the background start? They're very similar colors. They don't match well for sort of RGB guided things. But for us, it's trivial. Things that are in the foreground in this first talk uh, in this like, you know, cause it's a geometric method, things that are part of the object will all move together. So all these big pixels basically self segment themselves because they all move in the same geometry. And everything in the background, it moves at a different speed. So it gets pulled into the back. And so what that means is that in the reconstruction, uh, it doesn't know what part of this statue is background or foreground, it just pulls it all together. We can actually do a lot better segmentation. We actually get a more, uh, a correct analog solution for what's going on. Yeah, and again, in the background where we don't know stuff, we just don't touch it. Great, awesome, all right. We have solved 3D imaging forever. There is no more problems in 3D imaging. Uh, you're welcome. Quit the field now, right? That that was a joke for for the record. Um, uh, much in the same way that we ask ourselves after like a catastrophic disaster, like the Boeing planes going down, we I think as a PhD student, it's very good to look at your previous papers and think to yourself, where did we go wrong? What have we not done yet? Why have we not achieved the perfect super insane version of this pumpkin? Where do we go from here? By the way, where you should go from here is to that website to look at the paper. Um, just kidding. Yeah, what do we miss? That paper was really fun. It was a lot of fun, basically. Uh, it was kind of like a battle to show that in this source of data, which people kind of ignore, like we ignore the parallax effects of first photography. In that, there is actually a lot of super useful data. But we used 1920 by 1440 processed RGB, and we know we can do better. We can get 4K 12 megapixel images. Like we know we can do better than that. We had no control of the camera, no control over focal distance, no control over uh, any lens parameters, distortion, um, uh, exposure. Nothing. We just basically used this ARKit library and we trusted it fully. 
Oh, sorry. Actually, before I go into this, um, were there questions on this one? <laughs> that, that, this, this is a good time to stop because we're between two different papers. Um, if you're incredibly confused and or have questions, now's your chance. Are there questions about the stuff that I just rambled about for 25 minutes? I'm going to take that as a solid maybe. Yeah, so, so hello. So, uh, I have a question. So, so actually, if I understand correctly, so here you use the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Maybe you clearly take a picture of this bottle, mm -hmm. and then you will get uh, some shape, uh, the shape of the hands, you will get a bunch of lamps and depth values. And for, for this, since we can see that for this bottle, and also this is a chair, so mm -hmm. for, for some kinds of things, how can you uh, directly get the, get the depth or um, only the depth value of, of only this bottle, mm -hmm. but avoid the the effects of other um, objects like the chill or all this stuff. So yeah. So in general, uh, I have like uh, in in these examples, I have like an object on a floor. But in general, we're solving for one generic uh, RGBD thing. So in that setting, the 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 chair, the bottle, everything. Oh, hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in this setting, like if I were to take a picture of this desk. I, it's not specifically an object reconstruction work. I was just showing that uh, the, the target application is like you're Instagramming your food. So very often you have an object on a thing that you're taking a picture of, but it is just a generic reconstruction algorithm. It treats everything in the scene as just like one, uh, one depth scene. So if I were to take a uh, photo of the table right now, it would reconstruct this and this and the cup and the laptop and everything behind it, probably very poorly because these don't have great contrast, but it treats it all as one scene. But a thing that you mentioned that we will get back to uh, later is occlusion, which is what happens if you have an object in front of another object. And the answer to that one is it's not yet solved, but if anyone wants to work on that, I will happily be your good author. Um, so that one's still an open problem, but great question. We'll hold, we'll, we'll hold on to that one. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. So I see that uh, I understand that the first baseline mix that you show uh, was you like randomly initialize a depth map and do all the things you do here. Mm -hmm. So how about we use Midas or anything uh, deep learning method and to initialize a depth map and do all the things you do? Or what would you come up? So I think yeah, you might be cheating. You might be thinking of the next paper. <laughs> uh, in in this paper, we're actually. Um, the method uses the LiDAR depth. So we're actually initializing with the iPhone depth, which is basically Midas. So in this, in this work, we are using the initial depth estimates from this monocular depth thing. In the next work, we will not be. Um, is that true? Did you perchance, did you perhaps read the next work? <laughs> okay, cool. With no further ado, uh, the next work. What did we miss? No camera control. We trusted the air cat stuff completely blankly. And this is the big one. There's a reason this is highlighted in red. We did kind of the same thing that Nerf does, where Nerf uses coal map pose estimates. Most Nerf methods use coal map as just this ground truth thing that spits out camera poses when there's actually a lot of sources of error in estimating camera poses. Like they're not ground truth. Same thing. AR kit. Uh, this, uh, you know, Apple library is amazing for if I walk around NTU and I come back and I'm doing like some slab mapping, awesome. But it's actually not ground truth. It is, they're still using some mobile slam pipeline. It has errors. It is not a, uh, it is not a zero error system and it is not ground truth. And so the question that we we're looking in this second work, this is uh, started this past summer. Wrapping up now, I'm running the camera ready. It'll be great. Um, I will publish the code soon, I promise. I, I'm just very lazy and uh, have been working on other things. In this work, we are looking for how to go from here, which is where we were, across RGB, processing the library, a little bit further up the stack. So closer to where actual scientists live in like the Google camera team or the Apple camera teams uh, to raw processing to like closer to the data that you actually get out of the phone. And so with that, I bring the next paper.
Uh, I think the paper, the paper title is very funny. It's Shakes on a Plane. If you do not know the reference, that is sad, but uh, there's a movie called Stakes on a Plane. It's very funny. <laughs> I'm, this is honestly the proudest I have ever been of a paper title because everyone like I talk to you about it, they're like, this is a very easy to remember paper. And I'm like, that means, it's, that means it works. Um, so yeah, this paper is titled kind of the same way as the previous paper because it's kind of the same thing as the previous paper, but just slightly different. Um, and so to make this paper, I had to write a whole new app. It was very fun. Uh, basically moving from ARKit, which is the sort of high level Apple library for doing AR, VR stuff, all to AV Foundation, which is this lower level library for just controlling camera things. And I have video on the right of it, of this app. You can walk around, it has, a, uh, so basically I coded like a viewfinder, you can point at things, you get exposure and ISO values, you record bundles. And uh, this may not seem very exciting, but uh, the more important thing is actually the thing on the right, which is that in my previous method, I had to download all the data by hand using iOS deploy, which is this like terminal command line tool, which is a pain to use. And then in my new app, I, I big brained it and I made it so that you can airdrop the data to yourself, which is super convenient because <laughs> like I'll be walking around my lab, like recording data. And by the time I get back to my laptop, it's already there because I'm just like airdropping it to myself as I record it. Super convenient. Uh, the lesson in this is like, even as a PhD student, you can't avoid like software engineering stuff. If you can make your, if you can write code to make your life easier, like, yeah, yeah, PyTorch code, like your LaTeX paper is very important, but like, if you can write a bit of code so you can airdrop data to yourself and save yourself like an hour per day, worth it, just do that. Anyways, I can uh, demo this on the video, but I am here in person, and so I have brought the phone in person, and so behold, an app. Um, if you observe the app, there is a viewfinder on the right, there's a viewfinder on the left. It's basically just a regular camera app, you point at that stuff, it records data. Um, the hard part here is that uh, if you were to write this, uh, write this thing yourself, you will find out very quickly that there is a lot of complications in how to record and get data off the phone. This is a mess. Um, essentially, I have to hijack a bunch of operations in the Apple camera pipeline and drop a bunch of buffers. I am quite literally just hacking what the code is supposed to be doing. You're supposed this code is supposed to be for making apps in, in the app store. Like you make a camera app to take a picture of stuff. But I'm like, he he ha ha. If you dig into this buffer, you can actually get the raw data for the, like the frame values, and you can get a bunch of stuff out of this app that I don't think they they knew you can get out of AV Foundation. But yeah. And so what do we, Ilya? What do we get out of this app? We have a beautiful app interface that I designed in about 12 minutes. It has all the things you need, such as a button to record things and no other buttons. We get we get rotation values. So uh, these are not poses, by the way. Big asterisk. These are gyroscope values. You can find these on any device. They're always there. We get rotations, we get timestamps, we get intrinsics. So we get the focal length of the, of the lens. We get a bunch of me metadata like black level, white level, encoding parameters, lens distortion tables, et cetera. And we also get a bunch of data that I'm not showing here because we don't use it in method. You get your depth LIDAR frames, which we will throw out because we don't like them. You get RGB values. You get raw. Uh, you get 14-bit raw values. You get lots of stuff. Uh, so these are the raw frames. Now we're we're looking at 4,000 pixel by 3,000 pixel, so 12 megapixel bare raw frames, 14-bit unprocessed straight from the ISP. Great. And uh, if you notice, last time we collected 120 of them in two seconds. This time we collect 42 of them in two seconds, partly because I like the number 42. And mostly because um, collecting raw buffer data is very, very slow. It's a lot of data that you need to pump through the, uh, the ISP, the uh, image ship. And so you drop the frame rate to about 21, 22 FPS. What does this data look like? It's, uh, if you remember the frog video from before, there's not a lot of parallax. If we look at the first frame we acquire, we zoom into this little part of the, the pedal, get that picture. 
take the second frame, we zoom into that part of the pedal. The parallax, so the motion that we get from depth, is that. So we get about a couple, like a couple dozen pixels in motion in parallax that we're trying to estimate depth from. What does this data look like IRL? Um, something I, uh, I'm i going to say words that have never been spoken by any author before, which is that I actually highly recommend reading the supplemental document from my previous paper because it has some fun graphs in it. What does this data look like? It looks like a lot of things. Handshake, so in when you're doing any kind of like human collected data, again, because humans aren't machines, you have a lot of randomness when it comes to collecting data. Sometimes you have your arm fully extended and you're trying to take a picture of the merlion at a weird angle. And sometimes you're holding your hand, you're holding your phone with two hands because you're in a crowd and you, that's how it is. So sometimes handshake data, you get like a, 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 on the order of a centimeter of handshake. So if we play that again, you get this, you get this kind of scale. Sometimes you get this kind of scale. Sometimes you get that kind of scale. For the most part, we look at this. This is sort of the average handshake. This is the if you're holding your phone with one hand at a, uh, like with a broken elbow and you're taking pictures of stuff, you get about a couple mill millimeters, five, six millimeters of motion. This is mostly the day we're looking at. But in the paper, we also talk about small things, big things, the issues with those. I'll, I'll drop this. This is, we won't really talk about this that much, but I'll just drop this as a concept of. Um, this is not a solid field. There's a lot of stuff that you can solve if you would like to. Um, if you don't have a lot of motion, you have very weak parallax click, uh, cues. So things don't move a lot. You don't have a lot of motion from which to estimate depth. If things move a lot, then remember uh, three episodes ago, you mentioned what happens if the chair is in front of the model. That's that. If things move a lot, you actually break the RGBD model because now um, you're trying to solve for one array, so one depth map. But if you have something moving behind something else, you now have overlapping content where like technically from this frame, you see the chair but from this other frame, you see the dog or the bottle behind the chair. So this is a cool place to live, but actually these are both um, interesting areas to explore. So, so shakes and not playing. This is the, the more fun model that I said I would spend more time on. because it is actually a lot simpler than my previous paper. Like compared to my previous paper, I actually ripped out one half of the model. Um, in the previous paper, you saw we projected from some reference frame into 3D space, and then we back projected, we projected back from 3D space into a query frame. Here, we're actually going to do only one direction of projection. We're just gonna go from random frames into some global model. There's only one forward projection. And so what we do, as we grab a camera a coordinate UV. All right, by raise of hands or nods or any other emotion, uh, are we familiar with XY versus UV? I see one question, two, two questioning both. Because um, this is the only thing that we, we need to like kind of cover. Uh, there is image space, so like camera space, UV coordinates in, in your camera frame. And then in real space in the world, there's X, Y, Z. So UV means uh, this is like, say, 3,000 by 4,000 pixels. This is kind of your pixel location, where you are in the frame. We're still trying to solve for one RGBD frame. We're trying to solve for one flat sort of depth representation. And the, uh, so we grab a point in UV, we grab a point in this flat reference frame. And then we use this to sample into a multi-resolution hash encoding by other arrays of hands. Who has seen multi-resolution hash encoding before? You're gonna take half hands. Uh, if you read Instant NGP, that really fast NVIDIA paper on doing nerf representation super fast, that is that. Essentially, it's a fancy encoding, um, which is uh, kind of classical computer vision. Uh, if you imagine your, all right, we have limited marker ability, but if this is a map of Singapore, uh, I don't know, we're in Sentosa or somewhere, 
I don't remember how to spell something. Is it S E N or S? Whatever. We're in Singapore. So. Uh, if you're telling someone where you are in, on a map in a place, you sort of start with the rough coordinates of like, okay, I am at NTU. So this blocks off like you're in this block. And then more specifically, you can be like, okay, I'm near the material science building at NTU. That's this block. I'm in the parking lot, F. That is this block. And I am at space number 37. That is this block. We are doing the same thing, but in fancy math stuff with image coordinates, we take a, a coordinate UV somewhere in the image, and we map it to this sort of hash representation of we are in this part of this big block, this part of like we're in the top left corner of the big block, the bottom right corner of the small block, the top left corner of the smaller block, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a fun encoding because basically your network, the thing that you pass this into, it's now able to use multiple sort of grains of information to, uh, to map to some function. So we shove this thing into an MLP. Uh, this is another implicit network, just you know, 128 hidden size couple layer network. And we're trying to learn a function that maps UV to RGB. So I input pixels, I input uh, locations in uh, an image and then map them to colors of a rabbit. So in this case, you know, bottom left corner, uh, U, I don't know, 4,000 B0 would map to green. This would map to a different green, blue, orange, et cetera. Try and learn, you know, some continuous uh, 2D coordinate to RGB, so three channel image. Does this sort of, uh, as we say in my country, does this buy? Does this make sense? That you can learn a continuous function by just agreeing the set and just penalize based on color. I can fit a network to represent an image. Bingo. Cool. And then we do that again. We have this mini step that I'll go, go into a little bit more. Uh, we actually apply a weight to these, uh, to these encoding parameters. So we weigh some resolutions that are greater more than others. And we map that to depth. So this maps UV coordinates, coordinates in the image to RGB. That maps UV coordinates in the same image, same space, but to uh, D, to depth. So this is two dimensions to one, two dimensions to three. Cool. If you slap these two things together, so you take these guys, we pull them over here. If you combine these two things together, and then uh, here's the, uh, if you remember the title was shakes on a plane, this is plane. Basically everything that is not the object, like everything behind this thing, we just pretend that it falls into a back plane. If you squish all these things together, you get an RGBD representation. The RGBD is we got colors of the rabbit, plus we have the depth from some thing. In some reference frame. And now we have a motion model. This is because I may have forgotten to uh, emphasize this, but in this work, we're, we're throwing out that LIDAR, we're throwing out ARKit, we moved to this new library. We want to say that, um, I don't know, I don't want my work to just be exclusively for iPhone something pro users. I want this to be applicable to uh, a lot of different imaging pipelines. And so now I want to work with. I just have a stack of images. So I just have that, um, that micro motion uh, burst bundle. I just have that stack of images. I want to squeeze out uh, depth information from just that stack alone. No, no other external measurements, no external libraries. This is all just one model that you just drop data into. So now because of that, we actually need to estimate where our phone is in space because in order to get this, uh, you know, uh, 3D representation, we need to know at what angle we're looking at the thing from uh, for which frame. And so now we have a, a motion model and we cheat a little bit, which is that uh, phones actually know their rotation. They have a gyroscope in them, which is a big spinny thing that spins real fast and then tells you, actually they don't spin anymore. I lied to you. Uh, it is a wiggly thing that wiggles really fast. Uh, if you have questions about that, I will explain later. Uh, 
I actually didn't know this. Gyroscopes in phones, like MEMS gyroscopes, uh, I used to always think of them as like a spinning wheel that you applied torque to. In modern phones, they're actually like weights that bounce around on a screen. It's cool. Anyways, uh, I digress. We, this is the, so red is the only thing that we're inputting into the system. We input a bunch of images and we grab one of them. We grab these frames out of them. And we input some rotations that are basically estimated by the phone's uh, little internal sensors. This is the thing that tells your phone to sort of switch to a landscape or portrait mode, depending on which way you're facing it. And then we estimate rotation translation, and we take this model and we project it to a new space. So basically, we rotate and we translate that bunny. And then we take that point, and then this is our loss. So this is this is where things get fun. All that we've all that we have to the left side of this is some just generic model that models RGB in depth. And then the way that we fit it to this data, to what we have acquired, is we basically, this is what I meant by we only have a forward projection step. We make it such that if you back project, like if you forward project this point to uh, like, we basically say at frame number 37, with translation 37, rotation 37, at coordinate something in this rabbit, this will map to this part of the bundle of this first data to this part in the burst data. And then we want to minimize the difference between these two things. So if in the burst data, the erratic is pink over here at this point at this time, we want it to be pink over here at this point, at this rotation. And then that is actually an extremely complicated term. And I recommend reading the large paragraph I wrote about what the loss function is here. 95% of like the time I spent on this work. These are actually all easy to code. Um, the loss function is actually, is the only thing that determines how this uh, method works. The left side of this is just a generic image model. This is actually what convinces it to learn something. Uh, this loss function is very, uh, is pretty complicated because it looks at basically both photometric consistency, making sure pink maps to pink, but also it looks at uh, making sure your yeah, background maps to the plane. It's the thing that actually segments this bunny out. And it's uh, the thing that makes sure that your depth is locally consistent without having to oversample lots of stuff. Don't worry about it. Uh, that projection model. So this, this little piece over here, we're going to look into it a little bit closer. What I'm saying is basically, I have a rabbit. He is um, colorful, stripey. Uh, by the way, this rabbit is in every single paper I've ever written in my life. Uh, I made a I made a vector graphic of the Stanford rabbit, and I I keep changing like you know the colors and the texture. But he is in every single paper, like first author, second author, last author. Every single paper you uh, you read that has my name on it will have this rabbit somewhere in it. <laughs> He's very important. So if I were now doing this problem in two dimensions, because two dimensions are easier to three. If I have this stripey colorful rabbit. And I take the camera image. So like think, think that like I'm looking from below the rabbit. I see blue here. I see green here, orange, red, pink, purple, magenta, whatever. The level you will. And for each of these points on the camera, I have a depth. My rabbit is this far away here, he's this far away here, he's that far away here, he's that far away over here. These, these are my depth values. If I now get another view of the rabbit. My, uh, my camera has moved a little. So I have some translation, some rotation. And I remember what the correct depths are. So I remember in this, in this photo, I knew that my depth was this point is this far away, this point is that far away. Well, I still remember, remember those things. If I know my rotation, my translation, and my depth, then I can just use trigonometry. Like I can just use regular old geometry to say that, oh, draw the triangle up by this depth and then rotate and translate by that, by this, you know, these, these camera values map over here. And if my depths are correct, so if this, everything goes right, then pink maps to pink, orange maps to orange, blue maps to blue. This is an important step. Is this clear? Does this make sense? 
if I know how far things are away from me, so I know how my camera has changed, I know how far things are away from the camera in space, I can just draw a bunch of triangles to figure out where those colors match. And this is photometric loss. Uh, the way that you like optimize this thing is if pink maps to pink, orange to orange, if these are colors are all the same, we're doing Gucci gang, we're doing great. However, if we have a terrible, awful rabbit and our depths are at the wrong places, so we thought that the edge of this rabbit was over here and that his head was over here, these were the wrong depths. Then if we do that same triangle thing, that's gonna map to green, that's gonna map to green, and that's gonna map to red. And these are not the actual colors of the rabbit. So there's not, these are not the reference colors. This doesn't make sense. And maybe this is my depth is bad. Another uh, example I could have here is that you actually misestimated the translation rotation. You're sampling the wrong part of the rabbit. This is inconsistent. This is a loss. This, this is the thing that we optimize for that we need to fix. We go from here and we pull it to there. What does this look like in principle? We have an input data. So this is our, our handshaky data, me trying to take a picture of my beautiful gourds that I uh, bought from Whole Foods on lab money. And on the left, we have uh, the estimated camera motion in XYZ, like how it thinks this camera is shaking. It's kind of hard to see the mapping, but it looks pretty. And what happens over time, so what happens in this optimization is we iteratively, we sample a bunch of rays, same sort of like, again, NERF optimization, we iteratively sample a bunch of things and we try to make the colors consistent, both this RGB and D all consistent. So we want one image, one depth that explains everything in the entire bundle. And over time, basically like, we start with a crappy blurry representat representation of the scene and we optimize and optimize and optimize and map these things to the right places and we get cool rays. So again, our only input to the system is this shaky, uh, me trying to take a picture of a, of a dragon on a table. And in order to make all these measurements consistent, we just fit this model. We just like, there's no, there's no training data. There's no label data. There's no nothing. We just drop this data in. And then in order to make these uh, views, like to make these, all these pixels consistent, it finds this depth solution. And again, the key term here to the thing that I brought up earlier is uh, over per over parameterization, we are trying to find one depth map, so one 2D depth thing, one 2D image thing that explains all of the data that you have in your, uh, in your long two second video capture, essentially. So you can't, represent the, you, can't, uh, you can't represent this video capture as multiple frames anymore. You have to represent it as one frame that's moving in space. This is my favorite one. I, I love this one a lot. And this one's actually kind of yeah, easy to see the motion, where the motion model is like how, what it matches with. Because if you think about like, where the, does the phone have to be in space to like match this data? It's like you shake up, down and up again. And this one's really cool because you can see the, the, the texture coming in. You can see like basically it's like a, a mushroom growing. So you see at the beginning, we have a very, very bad model, blurry, awful, nothing makes sense. And then we find one sort of camera and um, depth model such that everything makes sense now. Yeah, so to actually when you take the photo, so is it direct digital view or, or just a big long photo? So uh, to make, so the input data is this, is this a shaky branch? And this is uh, directly captured from basically my app. Uh, it basically has a slider here, but like I want to capture 42 frames or some amount of frames, and it captures a short video clip every time you press the button. Okay. So, in uh, by the way, in practice, like that's not how you would do it. If you think, if you look at things like Apple Live Photo and uh, Motion Photo, etc., when you're taking a picture of stuff, you have a constant viewfinder, so you don't actually have to wait. You don't have to tell the user to wait a couple seconds. You can actually just stream all this data to a buffer. And when the user presses the button, you just take the last two seconds before the user pressed the button. So and that's actually what live photos do. They, they have a circle buffer and they take one and a half seconds before you press the button. So that's this collected data. That's me, again, just standing next to a thing, taking data. And I want to emphasize that I am not trying to shake my hand or do things. 
Uh, statistically, based on the last paper, I actually have the like third least shaky hands in the lab. So I'm making this, I made this whole project difficult for myself because like I don't drink enough caffeine. Um, and just by fitting that data, that's where you get this speed of animation. This animation is just like training iterations over time. So iteration zero to iteration like 10,000. In practice, this takes 15 minutes on an A100, which is very fast for this field and extremely slow for actual products. So take that as you will. And then I did some Blender simulation to make sure that the things that we are, we are calculating are somewhat reasonable. So I, I, did, I got a 3D scan of these objects. This is like a plastic bird I have on my desk. I took it, I got like a professional 3D scan of it. Then I imported it into Blender, textured it, uh, rendered it, and then basically made, made sure that our model is actually matching what we expect to see. And we see that for this kind of data, we basically find exactly, exactly the ground truth. Except for that one bumpy bit, I don't really know what happened, but tail, tail, branch, branch. And this is a, a great emphasis. Like um, you can look at the supplemental of this paper. Um, this is a great uh, sort of demonstration of geometric depth recovery versus learned depth recovery. If you ask a machine learning algorithm to tell you what the depth of this thing is, it will kind of cry in a corner because this is not reasonable. This is there's no training data that looks like this. Uh, if you so if you do try to do like single image depth reconstruction, it, it does not know what what this thing looks like. But from this geometry, from this micro baseline stuff. We're just solving for analytic geometry. We're doing, we're mathematically getting the step. We're not trying to match image features. It's able to, to get that word. Cool. Um, there's lots of results in the paper. Uh, I won't go too far into them. Learn methods, mixed methods. So they uh, initialize with learn and then do some stuff with it, like HNDR, which was the last paper I did. And then multi view only. Uh, in general, uh, if we go from like by, by columns, learn stuff makes depth maps that are very free. One thing that machine learning methods are very good at is they you feed them one quadrillion pieces of data and they will produce outputs that always look good. So that looks awesome. That looks like a dragon. These look like pumpkins. Like these are these look like they're doing really great. Same thing for all these. But as we will get to it, these are not uh anyway, really correct. Then HNDR, sometimes awesome. Like for the pumpkins, you uh, again, sorry, because they probably pop us a bit off. The pumpkins and the dragon are great, the tiger is okay. And then for Harold, um, this is kind of where my last method fails because we assume these ARK poses are ground truth. And we're trying to, uh, we do this like patch sampling brute force back and forth mapping. Uh, my previous method is actually very, very bad in low contrast regions and a, a, around sort of big changes in color. Another thing is that uh, this guy uses 1920 by uh, uh, like 1240, so it uses half the, or like a quarter of the resolution, and it uses RGB, so very very low bit depth. So basically, this guy struggled like previous paper struggles with a lot of stuff. But one of the cool things is the previous paper is actually a depth combination method. So the things in the background, like that tree, you can still have like a sort of estimate of the tree because we're combining multiple couch. We're combining multiple estimates. Uh, barf, bad. This is basically depth supervised nerf, but not really. Um, same problem as we mentioned before in the class, which is that uh, uh, over parameterized, you're solving for XYZ, you can solve for things that aren't actually geometrically correct. There's actually a paper from Andrew Kanazawa that, uh, from her group that came out like a couple months ago that actually complains about this a lot, which is that a lot of modern nerf methods don't obey projective geometry that are just kind of making up stuff as they come along. And then this is from 2016, that's from an unsupervised small motion clip. This is a really, really awesome method. Uh, and I think that like, this is actually a really good comparison to like, what is the difference between this classic sort of method for depth from small motion and my method for depth from small motion? This is a classic method. This is, you do feature extraction, you find like, uh, corners and edges and features, you match them, you do bundle adjustment, you estimate the depth of these sparse feature points, and then you use that to basically like paint regions based on their color. And that's why you see these like really big regions. 
But the issue of this classical stuff is because you're doing sparse feature matching extraction, blah, blah, you're doing these, these discrete steps that have no way to talk to each other. You actually solve for very sparse step solutions. If you actually look at what this guy looks like in 3D, it's kind of like a level set, like, you know, very, very coarse resolution. Whereas here, we're pouring all of the pixels in. We use every single pixel we have, and we're squeezing, we're doing depth estimation at the same time as pose estimation, and we're doing it all in this continuous wallet. We're training end to end. And so we're actually able to use, uh, we get much smoother and much more uh, uh, high fidelity reconstructions because we're actually able, to, we're not working on sparse features, we're working on every single pixel we have in the image. And we're trying to squeeze to that. And the reason we can do that is actually because of this hash encoding, because GPUs have gotten faster, because stuff. So things that I'm not mentioning, but like it takes a village to raise a child. Like the reason we can do that is because of the whole field is evolving. And yeah, let's talk about object reconstruction. Remember before we said that Minus is really good at making dragons that look like dragons? The reason is because the stuff that these machine learning uh, methods output is edge aligned, it looks like the image it's taken from because it's trained on image data. But if you actually take the 3D object, you look at it, um, there's a saying in sort of depth reconstruction, which is it's very easy to lie with color maps. It's very hard to see the difference between that and that from the depth map. But if you actually look into 3D, if you project these points, so this is the professional scan that they got in the library. This is our thing. You can see we, we're losing some of those claws, some of those features, but in general, you know, for something that's from a tiny motion clip, pretty good. That wing's not even attached to him. He doesn't have a mouth. Like there's, if you actually look at the side profile, the geometry is wrong. This is a golf ball. This is a pumpkin. This is a pumpkin. That is a sad wingless dragon. That is a dragon. Same thing for birds, actually pretty good. It disconnects the wing because it doesn't realize that these are connected regions. It sees this is dark, this is light, so it segments them because it sees an edge there. But in reality, there's no edge there. These are connected regions. So again, this thing sees it sees an image, it assumes stuff about it, and then it's not, the geometry is not correct. It sees an image, it sees uh, these arms, it doesn't realize they're all part of the same object, it rips them off. Oh, uh, it rips them off in a bad way, we rip them off in a good way. Analytically, analytically correct, visually correct. Cool. And then the last sort of slide I have, there's a lot more results, but as I said, uh, I'm working on the camera ready. So I'm still working on my Blender renders. My computer has crashed a couple of times, it's great. But um, I'll have a lot more fun stuff eventually, hopefully. If you're going to see VPR, please uh, uh, say hello. Um, one of the fun things that you can do is that we're why are we doing this in the first place? We want to go from RGB to RGBD. And why do we want to go from that, uh, from one to the other is because this is a boring lame image. There's actually, we've kind of run out of things that we can do with RGB at this point. Like images are pretty good. Like you can take pictures of tomatoes and they look like tomatoes. But if you go to RGBD and you actually have, you're able to get a spatial representation of this thing, you can have a lot of fun with it. You can splash water on him. You can relight him. You can put cloth physics on him. You can, like, uh, you. Uh, I'm hoping that basically in the next couple of uh, like years, next five ten years, well, we're going to go from like sending people pictures of stuff that we're doing to sending people scenes of stuff that we're doing. Like, if you're on a cool, uh, I don't know, ski trip in Hokkaido, I don't want to like see a picture of like you on your skis. I want to like be able to like tilt the photo and actually feel like I'm in that place. I don't want to take a picture of a, I don't know, a statue in a museum and just like have that in my phone. I want to be able to actually like relight it. I want to play around with it. I want to put TikTok filters on it and send my friends and like look at this dragon with a hat and whatever. So I'm like, uh, the main pitch of everything that I'm doing is that this is a computational imaging platform. It's a computer, it's a, suite of devices and sensors they can do a lot more than take pictures we have like we this is not a dslr we are so far past this being a dslr that we should look into this being uh it's its own sort of computational device with ar capabilities vr capabilities 
neural chips and integrated plot, whatever. Anyways, yeah, that's it. Any questions? Yes. Uh, could you go back to the, to the example for the reprojection stuff? Yeah, reprojection. Yeah. Let me do the thing where I just scroll to that part right here. Yeah, yeah. Say that um, given the pixel that uh, incur photometric losses, mm -hmm. um, it seems that you both estimate the motion model and the depth value, right? Yes. And I believe that it is new post problem because you, you got two part. You say that you can be up and one eyes, but mm -hmm. uh, from my personal, personal experience, I think the the, the, the rotation you take from the inertial motion unit is really lower than the rotation. So this cannot be to do in a feasible way. So mm -hmm. how can you deal with that kind of data? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you're now my favorite student in the class. That is uh, an awesome question. There's a lot of parts to it. Uh, let's. I'll talk about. I'll go from end to beginning. The gyroscope is useful for a lot of settings, especially. The ones where you don't have a lot of color information in the scene. Uh, I think maybe it depends on the device that you're using. The 14 Pro actually has a really nice gyro. Uh, the accelerometer is garbage. Don't use that thing. If there's, uh, it can't measure small motion because um, they bought a cheap one. But actually, ooh, uh, let me see if I can. I, I want to pull up a, my my secret work. Top secret. No no, no steel. Just kidding. This is uh, I'm working on my camera already. Um, the thing I was going to show is that uh, you actually don't need the gyro. If you throw out the gyro measurements completely and you just initialize the rotations at, at zero, this thing actually 99% of the time is fine. Uh, let me see where that picture is. That one. So if this is Ganesha with the gyro, this is Ganesha without gyro, you can actually still solve for it. It just learns the whole thing start to finish. And then let's talk about the more fun problem. Uh, you said the words ill post. Uh, those are dangerous words because I know what those words mean. And I have an eraser that did that anyways. You can tell me use the black words. <laughs> um, so uh, let's take that uh, like question apart into why, what, what did you mean by ill post? What you meant by ill post, if, uh, if I understood correctly, is that if you have this sort of parallax effect, like you see that you change the, the camera, um, you take a new frame and you see orange where before you saw blue. Like you're looking at a new part of the, the, the object, the color has changed. That could have, the color could have changed because of depth, because you're now seeing a new part of the object, you're seeing, uh, you know, uh, uh, the thing in front instead of the thing behind, or it could have changed because of uh, because of just the angle or the translation or rotation. And so, uh, basically, if you have some kind of object and your camera rotates and translates, and you have a you have like a, a new view, you go from seeing this thing to seeing this thing. Rotations and translations can look a lot. So if you if you rotate around the object, can look a lot like the object moving forward or backward, or like basically like the uh, the, the object itself having a different angle. And so, the re if you were solving for each pixel, if you were solving for depth and then the pixels rotation and translation, you can't do that. Uh, you would never find a solution. And the reason is because in that setting, you are over parameterized. Any motion in the pixel, so the pixel going left, and uh, let's actually pull up a, like a, sorry, an example of the data. Uh, if we look at that, if we look at our, our dragon, sort of motion in our dragon, if we have a translation vector for every single pixel, we can just arbitrarily like follow where the pixel is going. We can say it goes left, right, up, down, left, right. And then we can say that it has no depth whatsoever. This entire image is flat and different parts of it are moving in different ways. But that's not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're solving for a 2D depth map. So 
uh, UV to depth. We're solving for a 2D image, UV to RGB. But we're solving for uh, a uh, essentially a one dimensional, a, a single curve for translation and rotation. And so for each frame, for all the, the uh, 12 million pixels in the frame, each of them has an individual depth, but they all have to have the same translation rotation. So they're all moving together. So we so per frame, we have one translation vector, one rotation vector, and then we have the 2D depth. And that means that basically it, going back to the rabbit example, what in in the point uh in like the point solution sense yeah i lost him uh in in this figure it's very very hard to tell like oh am i guessing wrong is this green and blue is this error because i have the wrong rotation or wrong, wrong translation from one of these points you can't tell but if i change the rotation of this frame if i move this camera frame over here i'm going to shift every single one of these pixels and if that shift makes a like fixes this one pixel and breaks a thousand of them, that's going to be that's going to incur more loss. That's it, it's on average wrong. Whereas individually, I can shift this guy's depth one by one. And so what happens is your um, uh, that's actually like in the optimization you can see that you see that we're, we have this blurred unaligned thing, and then very quickly oh heck I didn't uh, I was trying to pause it. Very quickly, like in the span of a couple of iterations, it's blurry, blurry, blurry. And you pull all of these images together and you basically like sharpen them. And you see that depth hasn't been solved yet. There's no depth solutions. So at the very beginning, it's actually just learning the translation rotation because that's the best way to optimize to lower photometric error. That's the cheapest way. You update three weight parameters and you reduce the loss by like a thousand. And then once it's given up on that, it actually starts learning the depth. Because the depth basically like everything that we model is motion, that it, it reduces your loss very, very quickly by a lot. And then everything else has to be depth. That's that's everything that's not motion. Hopefully that uh, answers the question. Yeah, great question. I think I'm over time, so uh, let me know what I'm doing. Um, if anyone has questions on, I'm oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, yeah, so for one slide, uh, mm -hmm. you put the uh, metas and also the bars. So, so for the half paper, it also deals with the, uh, use the matching network matching to find the correspondence between different views and mm -hmm. also the also estimate the, the pose. Yep. And the so for, for one method when compared with bar, so can I um, understand in this way? So when you use iPhone to have this object, so actually you will have some depth uh, estimation or somewhat accurate depth estimation mm -hmm. to have your model to learn uh, such kinds of things because you also use uh, the photometric loss, the no, the no framework. Uh, yeah. The the way you can understand the main difference is that BARF or these NERF methods, they try to find the position of each of these points in space. Yes. So they're they're basically taking these bajillions of points and they're putting them in X Y Z space, and that is very very difficult because of, because of exactly the reason we were saying with the, the rotation translation or parameterization, you basically move these points anywhere in space and you can make them geometrically inconsistent, but they all look like the same color, so the nerf loss is zero. Ours is one dimension less. The reason this works and, and Barth doesn't is we cut one dimension. We kill Z. We're not solving for X Y Z. We're not putting these points in three D space. We're actually putting them into 2.5 dimensional space. And that is a much more well posed problem because every frame, all the frames together have to conform to the same one depth frame. Whereas in BARF, every single frame, every single point gets its own place in space, and the network can just map it to wherever it wants. So I can just brute force a solution that doesn't have any geometry in it. Makes sense. So BARF makes things look good. It's view synthesis, it just makes the output images look like real images. It does not care about the projective geometry. It does not have a depth model. It does not do uh, depth parallax estimation. It just it just has an MLP that's trying to make sure that the color of the thing that it spits out is the color of the thing that goes in. This is using color as a way to estimate geometry, but it uh, it has an actual projective projective geometry model in it. Yeah. So 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 when you find the matching of the 
correspondence between different pixels. So mm -hmm. after you also have the pulse, you can also use this to do the triangulation to get the depths. This does everything at the same time. Okay. So that, that's the whole thing. But actually, it's a back and forth. It's a tug of war. Again, going back to I don't know your name, but the, okay. the question I got okay. is um, once you uh, if you find really good like camera poses, you like if you're just if you're just doing like uh, if you think of like the loss curve, if you only optimize the camera poses, you can only get so low because you, then you're you're going to be um, max bounded by the error that you're getting from depth estimation. And then if I like lock my camera poses, I refine the depth, I can go a little bit lower in loss. But now I need to re-estimate my camera poses again, because for this new depth, the camera poses can be more finely estimated. And by doing this, like because we train all this end-to-end -end all at the same time, we can actually find like sub-pixel pose estimates. And why that's really cool is, uh, again, it's not yet in the slides, but it's in my top secret supplemental data. Um, when you have itty bitty teeny tiny motion, so that that tiger from uh, that lion from earlier, where you only had a one millimeter of motion, ours still finds pretty blobby solutions. Whereas HNDR, my previous paper, where we assume AR kit is ground truth, uh, this is such small motion that the the error from the AR kit from the pose estimation library is big enough to just tear this stuff apart. Like it just makes completely inconsistent uh, estimates. Cool. All right. Uh, thanks so much. Yeah, so uh, I also have one additional question. So for the metas method, so um, every it has achieved really good performance for the monocular with uh, depth estimation. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the future, if if every it uh, achieves a very big model to do this, so in the future if it comes out with a multi-view depth estimation big model to do some kind of things. So uh this yeah so there's a lot of different directions and branches for depth estimation um you uh th that's where if you remember the horseshoe curve there's a lot of different sort of trade-offs that you play uh if you look into monocular depth estimation like you're walking around a room you have sort of a uh, bigger baseline then you have to worry about occlusions you have to worry about changing changing light condition dynamic motion etc burst is a really nice pl uh, place to live because you have a lot of assumptions that hold, like your lighting doesn't change. You're very, you're actually pretty resi resilient to reflections and weird stuff, which you have to account for in monocular models. So they each have their own space that they live in. And in general, I think that you would have to kind of like work with all of these at the same time if you were if you were to make like a robust like end to end thing. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, this thing, this method still fails for a lot of stuff. So um, all of these are open problems. If you want any of them, just like. Send me an email. I can like give you advice. <laughs> um, far away things don't move a lot. High dynamic range things have high dynamic range. Thin things are thin. Uh, if your scene itself is moving, that messes with your parallax. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah, I'll have a camera ready version of this paper and code out by the end of March, I promise. And then you can, uh, if you have any lasting thoughts or questions, feel free to email me. I'll, I will try to respond. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Okay, so thank you. Yes,